this video is sponsored by Manscaped. Take Nicolas Cage, take a movie, slap a few taps of acid on top of it, and what you get is a colorful example of why Nick Cage might actually be a freaking legend. In this video, we follow the trippy trip of two lovers who get tangled up in August, pun intended, lose each other and find themselves again on a violent trip full of traps, claps and slaps. That's right, welcome to the Off Mandy 2018. In this video, we will attempt to beat demonic bikers, a crazy hippie cult, and the trip of a lifetime while Nick Cage is on a bloodthirsty vengeance trip, high on acid, to serve the justice that he deems <laughs> worthy. Let's go. <laughs> This has been a hairy week for many, so today I want to take the chance and talk about these nuts, alright? Manscaped has sent me this incredible package full of useful stuff so that I can stay fresh and clean for this summer to come. So thank you very much for this, Manscaped. The Performance Package 4.0 offers a complete set with everything a man needs. The lawnmower 4th generation, an electric waterproof trimmer with advanced skin safe technology, you know what I mean, that reduces nicks and cuts on the most sensitive regions of the body. To complement, they offer the weed whacker for your nose and ears, a crop preserver, ball deodorant, and the crop reviver, which I didn't know I needed until now. But yo, anything for these nuts, right? Now, for a limited time, you get a free travel bag and comfortable boxers on top of that. Check out manscaped.com today, get 20% off, free international shipping on top of that with our promo code BINGE. Help yourself or your boy to stay fresh, he won't forget it. Promo code is binge, link in the description. Thank you Manscaped for sponsoring this video and stay fresh, yo. Red Miller is a veteran and a recovering alcoholic who lives with his girlfriend in a wooden cabin. He is a lumberjack and she a gas station cashier to cover their life expenses. The couple lives near Crystal Lake in an almost isolated part of Shadow Mountains. When not working, Mandy is either drawing fantasy art or reading one of her books, while Red, uh, well, Red is, you know, doing Nicolas Cage stuff. In one of their conversations, we learn that the couple had their own share of troubles in the past. Red is a recovering alcoholic, and Mandy had a traumatic childhood in which her psychopathic violent dad spanked her as harder than your parents worked on yours. Hence, they decided to leave their old life behind and live in isolation off grid. They want to focus on meditating and recovering, rebuilding themselves. But if trouble wants to find you, oh boy, it will. And trouble in nature comes in different forms. You see, while we in civilization have to struggle with, you know, stupid bosses and incompetent politicians, in nature you are more likely to face off a wild beer. Or even worse, hippies that talk softly. So in the end, pick your poison, right? And our characters have made their pick. So let's see if we can come up with the antidote because shit is about to get lit. And when I say lit, I mean lit. One day, while Mandy is taking her usual route to work, she crosses paths with a van full of hippie cult members. Although the encounter did not last longer than three seconds, the cult leader, called Jeremiah, had a divine intervention and realized that Mandy is the one. Now, instead of sending her white rabbits to lure her over because she is the one, our wannabe Manson does it his way, right? So in their hideout, he calls in one of his underlings, Brother Swan, and after the typical cult small talk full of piercing stares from the leader and the helpless looks of Brother Swan as if he's seeing Jesus with a red lightsaber, Jeremiah orders him to kidnap Mandy by requesting the help of a vile bloodthirsty gang of brutal demonic bikers to bring her to him. At the same time, Merlene, another cult family member and former lover of Jeremiah, visits Mandy to gather some information. Mandy, being visibly uncomfortable, neglects security and embraces social norms and shares her address with the weird stranger. Her uncanny feelings about what just happened don't get better with Marlene leaving saying, See you later. Huh, that was a mistake, wasn't it, huh? Look, this is a terrible start. If I were Mandy, I would either avoid giving away my real address or lie about uh, where I live, duh. But it's too late for that now, isn't it? Therefore, I would call my boo, Nicolas Cage, and let her know exactly about what just happened. Maybe even leave the area for a while to make sure that I don't get any surprises. But this is a pretty vague statement, isn't it? You don't just leave your home because some random person gave you an uneasy feeling, right? I mean, you would constantly be traveling. 
but to brush it off as nothing is also not the smartest idea. I mean, at least brace yourself, right? That's what I'm talking about. Just brace yourself. Be ready for visitors to come. In fact, get yourself a gun if you don't already have one. Which, by the way, would be the biggest mistake when opting to live off grid. I am not the biggest gun enthusiast, but living in an area where the police will take hours to arrive at screams for self-protection measures. And that, my friends, means guns. Lots of guns. Thank you, Jonathan. At night, Swan with his cult companion summons the biker gang with a special whistle and offers a jar full of blood, of course, <laughs> and then gets them to help with the mission. And in exchange for their effort, he promises even a better Bloody Mary made out of one of the low-ranking tenor meted cult members. Alright, so from what we have seen so far, they fit right into the classical 1980s cult structure and dynamic, apart from the demonic bikers uh, that have actually appeared. Anyway, but leaving that aside, this cult is centered around a charismatic, psychopathic, self-absorbed leader, helpless children that believe everything you can come up with as long as you maintain eye contact and keep your voice stable, and a corrupted dynamic of everything is allowed if it's for love. No, it's not, because that's literally how every atrocity ever happened. So, um, nope. If I do end up finding myself in trouble with the cult though, the only aim that really matters is the leader. Once we can clip him, the problem will solve itself. But let's fast forward a little bit and see what happens next because um, the fire is about to get lit up, if you know what I mean. So um, later that night, Mandy and Red go about their usual night, right? Dinner, TV, smoking cigarettes, you know, just your average 80s couple with their average hippie call trying to convince them to mass suicide next weekend. The couple goes to sleep, oblivious of what is about to come, and with no security and no idea how to defend themselves against any intruders, abducting them is like stealing candy from a kid, although slightly less fun. They both get snatched and brought to their HQ or whatever you want to call this shack. In the next scene, Sister Morleen tells Mandy that the biker gang is gone and that Rat's safety depends on how good of a girl she is. Now the two sisters pass her an eyedrop of a hallucinogen, probably LSD, and sting her with a marinated wasp, which is a little bit strange, but you know, they're hippies, so who knows. It's probably because wasps stand for fertility, to be fair, but it could also be because of the neurotoxin that is inside their venom. Well, whatever the reason, our dear Mandy is sky high at this point. To be fair, okay, I would rather die sliding down a rainbow and fighting off a bunch of goblins than having to talk gibberish with those brain dead people in here, so might be a good thing. But here is where Mandy could have played her cards better. You see, if someone wants you so bad that they commission cannibals to kidnap you, he would do anything else for that matter. If I were her, I would play along and pretend to be receiving divine messages just like Jeremiah. I mean, this dude is completely delusional. If you talk their language, chances are they will believe you. And being high on LSD, for those that don't know, is a pretty helpful tool in constructing a story those freaks will actually believe. Best is just to stick with the basics, right? Talking about the light and the peace triggered by chaos, rebirth and you know, all that crap. This is the language these people understand and your ticket to freedom. This not only buys you more time, but it's also a fun thing to do, right? Never neglect having fun. Believe me, you can construct a complete alternate reality and people will believe it if you just remain confident. It's quite impressive, to be honest, uh, how the human psyche works. Now, Mandy, under the influence of the drugs, is dragged over to the room where Jeremiah and the others are chilling. He then proceeds and tells her about his visions, how he was robbed of his dream of becoming a world-class musician and then gives her a sample of his terrible music which unsurprisingly is about him. Not to mention that he starts dancing butt naked as well. Now instead of playing along with the whole thing, Manny does the next best thing, which also happens to be the worst thing you could possibly do. What she does is she starts laughing her ass off because, well frankly, this is insanity in human form, right? Now this of course triggers the insecure ass of Jeremiah, which, um, well, punishment must be enforced. He decides to visit Red, who is still cuffed outside, and tortures him with a stab of a pretty long dagger. This is followed by the others bringing out Mandy inside a cloth bag and burn her alive in front of Nicolas Cage. Now shit is about to go down people, we already know. Could this have been prevented though? 
Now let me know in the comments where our characters so far went wrong and how they could have stopped that from happening. Obviously, this is an important part of the story which fuels the rest of the plot. Nick Cage's rampage. The cult waits until Manny's torment stops and she finally turns to ashes. They pack their stuff and leave. When the cult leaves, Red slips his hands out of the barbed wire, a bit late obviously, but whatever, and enters his house with exactly two things on his mind, revenge and drinking a bottle of alcohol to fuel his anger. The next morning, he drives to one of his old friends uh, to retrieve his reaper crossbow and gathers some info about the people who messed with him and his, uh, well I guess ex-wife. His mysterious friend offers him a couple of handmade arrows while also warning him about the nature of the biker gang. He tells him that they have become drug-dependent barbaric beasts and that messing with them means a sure death. Now, despite all the warnings, Red still insists on revenge because he is not a man, no, <laughs> he is Nicolas Cage. Now at night, Red tries to ambush the biker gang by preying on them nearby a road. When they drive by, he shoots one of them but doesn't land a fatal hit. He tries to run him over to finish the job, but for plot convenience, his car flips and he is knocked unconscious. Now, you know, there would have been uh, better ways to go about this, but let's proceed. He once again wakes up in a foreign place, but this time cuffed on one wrist and nailed to the floor on the other. That's pretty bad. At the same time, he is supervised by one of the bikers who enjoys torturing him by stabbing him multiple times. There is no doubt that this is the most helpless situation so far. I mean, of course, seeing your wife burn to ashes is the worst thing that could possibly happen, but this right now, just 24 hours after that incident, is, um, well, it's pretty shitty, not gonna lie. Being cuffed is a severe limitation of freedom, and being nailed onto the floor plus stabbed repeatedly, well, that's pretty much hell. The only chance that he has is using his environment to his advantage, which he luckily does. He notices that he is cuffed to a loose pipe and that he's lying next by a pit. So he lures the biker over and pushes him into the hole as soon as he can. This was a very smart move, not gonna lie. Even though his chances were practically zero, he used his environment against his captor and ultimately ended up freeing himself. The only little thing that I would have done differently is search the room very carefully before proceeding. Now he explores the house and does find a box cutter, which to be fair is better than nothing, but to fight off a bunch of, you know, biker demons, you might want to opt for something, you know, uh, deadlier. Red makes his way out of the basement and does a pretty good job in staying hidden. He cuts the corners of the house without exposing himself. And once he gets to the living room where he finds another biker busy sniffing baking soda and watching adult films because uh, that's what people apparently did in the 80s, he tries to use the element of surprise and attacks the guy from behind. But his reflection in the TV ruins his approach. A hefty fight breaks out, which Red only wins because of his precious box cutter that I had bad mouthed a minute ago, so excuse for that. Now before Red can catch his breath from killing that dude, he just barely escapes a shotgun shot from the same guy that he pushed down the pit earlier. You see, the problem with pushing people off cliffs and or uh, into holes is that you can't double tap. Now this is the result, alright, so double check guys, double check. But Red, having watched every viral chiropractic hit out there, gives him a quick adjustment, but ends up miscalculating the force. At the same time, he notices a jar of LSD and thinks, hey, why not, this will surely help me fight demonic bikers, and takes a generous lick. Wow. Now once outside, Red shoots his last arrow at the remaining biker, but this guy refuses to die without putting up a fight first. So Red finishes him in the most convenient way and uh, lights up a cigarette with his burning, decapitated head. Now I don't care what you think about Nick Cage, okay, but there is only one actor that can pull this off. That's right. This kill was one of the most badass ways to make sure your enemy won't come back for you a second time. This is the only move that does not require a double tap. Well done. Now done with the biker gang, Red makes his way to the makeshift lab of the chemist, who supplies both the cult and the biker with drugs, and has a talk with him. As a way to, you know, offer sympathy, I guess, uh, and knowing what happened to Red's wife, the chemist tells him the location of the cult and how he can hunt them down. He immediately makes his way to the location and sets up traps on the road leading up to the cult's bunker. 
His traps successfully stop the van, which is being driven by Swan and Lucy, and when Swan tries to fight Red, he fails miserably, because Red cold-bloodedly shoves his spear down Swan's throat, finishing him off. However, Red stares at Lucy and chooses to spare her. I personally wouldn't take my chances, okay? These people are fucked up. But hey, to each his own. Now Red then sneaks up behind another cult member, this time successfully axing him in the head, undoubtedly receiving the MVP for this kill, and continues his killing strike with a chainsaw that Peep finds on the floor. At this point, you know, his lifelong experience as a lumberjack comes in handy, especially since the next opponent also wields a chainsaw, just a bigger model. But we know it's not about the size, people, it's about the technique, at least that's what she said. And she was right, because Red does it like a champ. One enemy less, a couple more to go. He comes across Sister Marilyn, who tries to offer her body to escape a certain death, but Red is not your typical simp, what did you think? He refuses and gets his revenge on her as well. He makes his way down to the final enemy, Jeremiah, and makes him beg for his life. So much that Jeremiah offers to play his clarinet to stay alive. But Red takes out all of his anger at Jeremiah, smashing his head with his bare hand like a mushy old watermelon. He then sets the building on fire, makes sure that he is perfectly framed, and makes his Nicolas Cage exit in a classic car with fire in the background, having had the pleasure of a lifetime. Look, people, holy shit, alright? I thought there was more to beat, but frankly at some point this guy just turned into a wrecking ball and destroyed everything in front of him. Not your typical movie, but nonetheless, uh, well, a special one. Anyway, thank you for watching, I'll catch you guys again soon, peace out, and binge another one.